event, human afterlives, how technology is changing what it means to be human. I'm very excited about this event. Um, and I think given that we have all spent the last nine months immersed in a world in which human connection is almost entirely mediated by Zoom, today's topic seems more relevant than ever. I think that we are all feeling that technology has changed what it feels like to be human or uh, to be humaning, a new verb that I just discovered in Sunday's New York Times. Um, anyway, leading us through this fascinating topic will be Andrew Flesher, who is a professor of English and professor of family population and preventive medicine at Stony Brook University. And he will be speaking on the virtue of mortality Elise Graham will present a different perspective on this topic um, by guiding us through the strange new world of cyberpunk necromancy. Now, it's almost impossible to summarize even the, the barest accomplishments the, the, of these two, so I'll give it a try. Um, I pulled out just a few things to highlight. Um, Andy Flesher received his BA in Medieval and Renaissance Studies and History from Duke University and his MA in Religious Studies from Brown University. And I, I think I, I wanted to talk about their training because I, I'm fascinated by the journeys that each of today's presenters have taken uh, to come to be the, the amazingly innovative thinkers that they are. Um, Andy has published four books, Hero Saints and Ordinary Morality, uh, came out in 2003. The Altruistic Species in 2007 won the Choice Award. Moral Evil in 2013 was the winner of the Prose Award. And most recently, he has written The Organ Shortage Crisis in America, which came out just in 2018. Um, Elise Graham earned her BA in English from Princeton, her doctorate in English from Yale, um, and then an MS in Comparative Media Studies from MIT in 2013. Um, her first book, The Republic of Games, um, Textual Cultures Between Old Books and New Media, came out from McGill Press in 2018. And in the last year, she has published two more books, A Unified Theory of Cats on the Internet uh, from Stanford University Press. Oh, there is, there is her cat, um, Theo, hello. Um, and um, you talking to me, An Unruly History of New York English from Oxford University Press. And she has, uh, at least I can't keep count, I can think of at least two more books that are well in progress. Um, non-zero number. A non, yeah, <laughs> a, a very non-zero number. Um, so I feel especially lucky that these two amazingly busy and productive scholars have been able to take time away from the continuous flow of wisdom that, that comes from your brains and onto the computer to talk to us today. So thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I guess I'll begin. I just wanna say thank you so much for that gracious uh, introduction, Susan. And I also wanna say, um, just flattered to be on a panel with Elise. Um, it's, it's a bucket list item. Um, and I'm sure you'll all know what I mean when we come to her. Uh, and, and I'm kind of giddy today because it takes me back uh, to my days when I was uh, pursuing a PhD in religious studies at Brown. Um, so this is, you know, some of this stuff uh, recalls um, research I haven't engaged in in 20 years. Um, so uh, Adrian, I, I think you're gonna share my slides. Thank you so much, because um, I can't really do it from here uh, efficiently. Um, can, and uh, uh, maybe the next slide. Start there. All right, I just want to begin with a couple caveats uh, about my approach. The, the first thing I want to say is um, there's a number of issues 
that one could raise ethical issues with regard to genetic engineering. And today we're going to talk about uh, a specific and powerful instance of that, which is CRISPR, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, but my approach is one of narrative ethics, where I use fiction as an illuminative way of indirectly putting ourselves in the middle of these issues in real time. Uh, it uh, combines one of my favorite activities, which is reading, um, with another activity, which is uh, deliberating over what I call non-no-brainer issues, issues where intelligent people um, can, can have you know, a number of perspectives. Uh, it's not obvious. That is something that's familiar to my approach. What is unusual about what I'm also going to do today is that I myself am not sure where I stand at the end of the day on this issue. Usually I have a direction in mind and I argue for that case. Uh, so I think one of the fun things that might happen during discussion is for us to sort of see where we stand and where these critical thresholds are uh, between uh, what on the one hand represents medical therapy and on the other hand, uh, enhancement beyond medical therapy and whether there should be a line that distinguishes uh, between those two. Uh, next slide, please. But before we do this, uh, it's important to know uh, what we're talking about uh, in medical humanities. Sometimes terms are not always obvious. Uh, I've done a lot of learning myself. Uh, I have to call my sister up, who's at Yale from time to time working on these things to, just to explain them to me in a way that I can understand it. Uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is a scissor, scissors-like chemical tool that can cut and customize stretches of genetic material, such as human DNA. Uh, and ideally, it does this with precision. Um, we're not quite there yet, but the tool is deployed to target a specific region of the genome and snip it in two. And then the cell in question responds, uh, acting urgently to heal uh, its genetic wound. That's sort of a term of art. Uh, using a similar looking stretch of intact DNA as a template as it pieces itself back together. And then the idea is to splice in a tailor-made template or deliberate design whereby the initially damaged cell is able to incorporate the intended change. So we're literally genetically designing here. Um, and the reason that this opens up a whole can of issues with regard uh, to bioethics is that CRISPR technology is used to cells to repair mutations that can cause hereditary defects. This is not merely somatic genetic editing, but genome editing. Heritable genes are what is in question here. So, and, and sometimes it's called germline editing, the process by which the genome of a human individual is modified for inheritance. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, it still fails to work in about half the samples examined. Uh, the article that I cite there uh, lists um, the optimism with which people thought we'd be able to be doing this sooner than we are, but we will be there. It's inevitable that we will be there, and since it's inevitable that we will be there, uh, it behooves us to talk about these things now. It's already been used uh, successfully, or at least in a measured way, successfully to treat hereditary blindness. Uh, Dr. Heijianku became famous uh, when he was, uh, when he advertised to have produced the world's first genetically edited infants. Uh, their father had HIV and he claimed the genetically engineered twins he created did not. I mean, this was never proven, but there was circumstantial evidence on behalf of it. He was arrested and there were a lot of concerns that were raised by the scientific community, which I'll talk about in a moment uh, pertaining to this research, over which there's really no uh, kind of universal oversight yet. But um, one thing that's clear is that technology is still progressing faster than we have the opportunity to reflect upon as a society. So the moral questions remain uh, just as salient as if this technology were already perfected. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a smattering of some fiction that deals uh, in a page turning way with genetic editing one way or another. The six books on the left are, you know, you can read and then there are three uh, things you can watch, two films uh, and a show that's become popular. Um, on Amazon. Uh, I could just speak for an hour on, on each of these, but I'll, I'll just take a couple of examples. Uh, in Oryx and Crake, um, Margaret Atwood creates a brilliant if misguided prodigy named Crake, and he creates this pill called the Bliss Plus pill, which is kind of a birth control pill, uh, but prophylactic in all sorts of other ways too, designed elegantly to rid us of external causes of death. And as this character of Crake explains, the pill you know, was, was intended by him not only to solve the problem of war, something he judged to be a function of misplaced sexual energy, 
but also contagious diseases, uh, overpopulation, all of which, and this is explained by Atwood, leads to environmental degra degradation and poor nutrition. So he thought that this pill, utopian pill, would create overpopulate, would, would, would curb overpopulation and in turn, in turn solve many of the problems of society. Um, but however, and this is the brilliance of Atwood's book, uh, as these maladies are eliminated, the more successful the remedy is, the less the idea, the very concept of remedy uh, has real purchase over its human character. So as the reader soon chillingly becomes aware, Margaret Atwood's tale is, puts us on notice not by virtue of the things that goes wrong, as you might expect in a Michael Crichton book, but because precisely because of what does go according to plan. And uh, I'll just also briefly mention Gattaca. Gattaca is interesting because in the film, the characters are divided into the beneficiaries of the latest genetic editing technology uh, for whom disease and debilitating human defects can be eliminated and quote unquote degenerates, which is a nice term of art, who are deprived of this technology. And the point is that the pursuit of the utopia is, not isn't, but is to discriminate precisely along these lines. There's something wrong with you if you don't avail yourself of this available technology. And the point of both of these examples and others I could discuss here is that the expected successful outcome is actually iatrogenic. The solution becomes worse than the already challenging present uh, with which we're meant to cope. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just a picture of Jennifer Doudna uh, in the book. She wrote the wonderful book called A Crack in Creation. She just won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, shared with her co-discoverer, Emmanuel uh, Charpentier. And you don't often see someone winning the Nobel Prize describing her research in a book, which is this book, uh, A Crack in Creation, and then spending so much time in the book talking about why we should be terrified of the research she just engaged in. I mean, you harken back to Einstein uh, reflecting on his role procuring the advent of nuclear weapons. Um, now, in, in, after she describes, you know, the, the beginning of, of how CRISPR technology came to be, which is around 2012, she goes at length into all the things that go wrong, really focusing on two areas. Number one, off-target consequences, so the things that we didn't expect, and number two, just the massive amount of technological things that still need to be attended to, um, for which there's no kind of universal oversight. But what's interesting is that after these passages, there's a couple full chapters where she continues to describe um, what we need to worry about when things go right. She talks about dictators and terrorists bending scientists to their twisted purposes, a uh, competitive research environment which precipit precipitates a get out of the way attitude to free up scientists from undue regulation and uh, abuse she interestingly and sharply attributes among others to Steven Pinker, um, a foregoing of the cumbersome chore of creating new protocol for conducting research on human subjects, much less working towards an agreement on who is to be defined as subjects, and even the creation of mutations likely to exacerbate already naturally occurring chains of events which introduce new diseases into the world. So she says we haven't thought about the consequences of successful applications of CRISPR. Uh, next slide, please. And, you know, you can put these uh, issues in the context of different categories of issues that could be raised with, with CRISPR. I just mentioned some of the safety concerns, um, which lead to untested and no universal precautionary measures that the scientific community has come to yet, as well as unintended or you know, off-target side consequences. Michael Crichton made a career out of exploring these. Another type of issue, and you could uh, see this as a Kantian issue that bioethicists usually raise, is commodification, which is the process whereby markets reduce different ways of valuing things to one dimension, often measured in money or some other tangible awards. Uh, it's reductive, which leads to the debasement of a good. Um, and so what will the price tag be on genetic engineering? Will a market be created? Is this making profane that which should be assigned to the sacred? You could see how religious studies folks would be interested in this. Another uh, issue which the film Gattaca uh, explores very well is that you've got potential discrimination against the poor as those with means have access to the new technologies. Uh, there's concerns about eugenics, right? So the horrible nature of gene modification 
removing one cluster of traits with another uh, possibly runs into conflict with uh, Article 13 of the Oviedo Convention, uh, which was 1997, which explicitly disallows any forms, even indirect forms of eugenics. But the issue that I'm going to focus on for the rest of today, uh, which really emerges quite nicely from fiction, is, is when everything goes right. I think that regulations, scientists will argue, and I think compellingly, that regulations can mitigate against the consequences of one through four. But how about number five, when things are going as they should, no side consequences, level playing field, full transparency, how does genetic editing and the powerful tools we have at our disposal for genetic editing today, how does that cohere with what at base is what we might roughly call human flourishing? And that's why I titled the paper I'm writing, The Virtue of Mortality, right? The virtue of the fact that we age and decline and deal with de defects either at the start of our existence or as we grow older. Next slide, please. And now my presentation becomes a little bit more fun and apropos of a Humanities Institute event. Uh, my research led me to reread uh, The Odyssey in its entirety. It is a wonderful book. I actually hadn't read it. I hadn't read Homer's book since high school, uh, if I could reveal that sin. And here's a wonderful instance from book five and six of the Odyssey. This is the part where Odysseus receives an offer of a life of untold bliss and painlessness on an island of paradise, which our hero, who is the symbol of mortality and struggle, rejects in favor of returning to his aging and mortal wife, Penelope. Calypso, of course, is the beautiful, intelligent, and ideal goddess in all sorts of other ways. But Odysseus turns down her offer to subject himself to fatigue, sorrows and the eventual death which the resumption of his journey implies. I love this quote uh, from book five of the Odyssey. I know my wise Penelope when a man looks at her as far beneath you in form and stature, he's talking to Calypso, yet notwithstanding my desire and longing day by day is still to reach my own home and to see the day of my return. And if this or that divinity should shatter my craft on the wine dark ocean, I will bear and keep a bold heart within me. Often enough before this time have worn wave oppressed me, let the new tribulations join the old. I love that quote. Uh, and Odysseus turns out to be prescient. Poseidon still furious at him for blinding his son, the Cyclops Polynetus. At this point, the saga makes him pay for his decision to depart from his temporary Eden on Ajigia. No sooner does Odysseus sail away than he is greeted by a massive violent storm, <laughs> some bargain. Odysseus knows what a goddess Calypso is, that she can make him godlike and, off, godlike and offer him protection from all dangers to come. While Penelope, mere mortal, he may never see again, adorned and dressed in the sweet smelling garments with which Calypso has sent him off and guided by a fair wind that is warm and kindly, Odysseus steals himself from the onslaught. And I'm just gonna read this other passage uh, from the Odyssey that I love. Uh, where Poseidon gathers the clouds, clutches his trident, and churns the ocean up, rousing all the blasts of all the winds, swath the earth and sea alike in cloud. Down from the sky rush the dark. East and south, wind clash together, the stormy west and skyborn billow driving north. Then Odysseus felt his knees and his spirit quail. In desperation, he spoke to his own heroic heart, Alas for me, what will become of me in the end? I fear the goddess spoke all too truly when she prophesied trouble on trouble to bear at sea before I reach my own land. Paradise irretrievably lost, Odysseus has to hell to face before regaining the familiar existence of struggle, failure, and occasional success. So here, implicit in Odysseus' decision is a judgment about what exactly it is to be human. And with this analysis, a determination about the threshold of struggle past which the which that existence with all that it offers evaporates. Odysseus comes to the conclusion that Calypso's offer is one which will lead to estrangement. In contrast to an existence he knows, the best, the best among all those available, where suffering has its place, dreams are delayed or destroyed, and triumph when it does come is hard won. Uh, next slide, please. So here um, I, I want to refer to uh, one of my mentors at Brown, Martha Nussbaum, uh, on Odysseus's decision. This is one of her lesser known books. I love this book, Love's Knowledge from 1990. And Nussbaum here is referring to what I call a threshold question, which arises in application of this narrative to CRISPR-like technologies. Why would it be acceptable to use existing gene therapies to fight cancer, 
uh, and other well-known maladies, but not use CRISPR technology to make us smarter, stronger, less susceptible to disease in general. By what authority do we determine when one debilitating condition becomes legitimate to target for defeat, but not another? We're going to have to do better if we wish to cast Odysseus into Poseidon's fury upon the ocean. Isn't overcoming challenges part of the point of science? Um, and, and here I think about uh, the scene that just the, from, from the um, Odyssey where Odysseus puts wax in his ears, right? And he ties his, his men, I, I'm sorry, he puts wax in his men's ears while tying himself to the mast so he can hear the sirens. He wants to, to understand that temptation, which he's to overcome, recognizing its beauty. He presents himself a challenge and is somewhat paternal, paternalistic with the rest of his uh, crew, who he fears that if he hears, they hear those sirens, they're just going to jump over to their death. Uh, but he would prefer the harder way there. And here uh, on this passage, Nussbaum remarks, we don't quite know what it would be for this hero, known for his courage, craft, resourcefulness, and loyal love to enter into a life in which courage would atrophy, in which cunning and resourcefulness would have little point since the risks with which they grapple would be removed, and in which love, insofar as it appears at all, would be very different in shape from the love that connects man to wife and child and human in the human world of poem. The very possibility makes one uneasy for where and who in such a life would our hero actually be? So Nussbaum segues here to a discussion of world records, um, which she notes are broken in just um, microseconds, right? They're not blasted away. It matters that in the Olympics, you break that record by just a little bit. It calls attention to the struggles by virtue of which the competition has even more meaning. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a book by Gregory Stock where he tries to address this question of how you distinguish uh, the legitimacy of attending medical therapy with these technologies um, versus the arguable illegitimacy of, illegitimacy of enhancing human capabilities. And he comes up with three categories. Uh, one is the restoration of lost or jeopardized capacities, one example of which could be, for example, to restore normal lung function through a transplantation. Uh, the second category is to improve existing capabilities. Uh, and here he mentions intelligence, height, mental faculties, our ability to concentrate through drugs, for example. And then finally, enhancements beyond the normal range, um, which are potentially the most problematic. So this is one way of maybe thinking about things. Uh, and he goes at length into, you know, how these categories really bleed on to one another. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, there's a typo there that, that's all one last name, uh, Kipchoge. That's uh, Elio Kipchoge. And he is the first person to run a sub two-hour marathon. Um, by Stock's reasoning, certain documented achievements become difficult to evaluate as they fall within, you know, one of these middle places. And one such example is the historic run by Kenyan Elio Kipchoge in Vienna. This was Vienna, October of 2019. Uh, he was 34, the first to break the two hour barrier uh, with the marathon time, as you can see there, one hour, 59 minutes, 40 seconds, and two tenths of a second. They got him down to the 10th. Uh, and there was a company that sponsored him. You see it there, you know, uh, Ineos Chemical, which guided his path the whole way with a laser beam to mark exactly the part of the road he should run while 41 professional runners paved the way for him, breaking the air the way a peloton does, the leader of its team in the Tour de France. This engineering feat reveals on multiple levels the sense in which humanity, to uh, use Stock's phrase, goes beyond the normal range, that third category, in light of which it may be useful to contrast this alleged violation with the achievement of removing a trait like blindness or deafness from the human experience, in the case of the, settling, uh, the setting of the world record through optimization of the conditions, changing the rules of participation in the activity is the thing at which one aims, if in a sense, in a knowingly illicit fashion. The adjustments made for Kipchoge intended to maximize his performance underscore the usual norms of breaking records in micro increments, affirming not subverting the so-called rules of the game. By contrast, however, the very point of fighting cruel disease, for example, ones which may include blindness and deafness, uh, some of which are monogenic, that is to say caused by uh, problems with one 
genome is to remove human hardship. So here the point is for the innovation in question to become that game changer. That's very interesting. Uh, next slide, please. And this is really the fun slide, uh, the student uh, and faculty participation slide. These are examples I come up with and go into at length in the article I'm writing. Uh, and some have happened. Some are a bit idealistic. Uh, some refer to uh, films and uh, th that last one, raise the age in which we can mother and father children biologically. A uh, little known fact, or maybe somewhat known fact, Mick Jagger was 73 when he fathered his eighth child. Uh, I'm somewhat late to the game of fathering a child myself and worried about that. Are these all things that we could do if we could do them? Now, there's some non-controversial uh, items on this list, such as Huntington's disease and Ty Sachs disease. These are monogenic conditions. Uh, but then there's some more controversial ones. Would we get rid of autism? I wonder what deaf and blind communities would think of if we got rid of those uh, conditions. I don't even want to necessarily call them disabilities. Certainly controversial is removing Down syndrome. Now, that's controversial in two directions. It's both controversial for me to suggest that might be an option uh, not being part of that community and controversial also for, for me to bar it also not being part of that community. Who speaks for the members of these communities? Uh, we all, or at least those of us who are a little bit older, remember the wonderful Stanley Kubrick movie, Clockwork Orange, uh, where there was an idea for removing uh, propensity for violent crime. Uh, something that might uh, do us well right now is if we could remove um, our propensity for tribalism that leads to irresoluble disagreement and political polarization. Um, today, as opposed to many, many years ago, uh, we don't have such a hard time procuring food, so maybe we could remove our preference for salts and sugars, which now cause hypertension and obesity. Um, and several other items on this list. How do you draw distinctions? And not only that, is there an underlying principle which we could consult to help us answer? That's really the meat and potatoes of the project I'm working on right now. Uh, next slide, please. And these are possible principles of adjudication here. Um, the first two are very similar, uh, even though they don't appear so. Vitalism is the idea if we can do it, we should do it, and we better do it fast, because if we don't do it, somebody else will do it. So this is the person that is most with it, if you will. Uh, there's a term called the precautionary principle. It's the proverbial yellow light. We should still do it, but we should, whatever we're doing as a principle, do it slowly so as to be able to acquire the time to think about it. These first two ways uh, of going about things really refer to the pace at which we advance uh, the frontiers of technology. And then there's um, this third possibility. Um, and before I get to the third possibility, uh, one um, advocate of which is Ted Peters. You know, Ted Peters talks about in a number of his articles, he's a bioethicist uh, whose background like mine is in religious studies. And he talks about the so-called non-controversial examples like Huntington's disease. And he gives a strong hypothetical case uh, for why this should be uncontroversial, why this falls exactly into that first category of stocks, medical therapy. But then he says this, um, but you know, there's still a sense in which we'd wanna pause. Now, why is that? And he rhetorically asked, do bioethicists wanna see Huntington's patients suffer? No, that's not the reason. Their judgment was based on what we don't know. What we don't know if the long-term effect of such large-scale changes is in the genome will be. Genes work with other genes and other DNA and delicate systems like Swiss watches, mutually influencing one another. To eliminate one set of gears in an old-fashioned switch watch would cause it to self-destruct. And here's the rub. You never know what gears you're tinkering with. I learn this all the time when my phone gets clogged up and I delete something only to realize I have to call tech support to get my email reinstalled on my phone so I can check it at home. Right? We don't understand how evolution has taken years to make the world homeostatic. Um, I have a lot to say about this, but I wanna to get to Elise. Uh, so I will just leave it at that. This idea of emergent probability is the process of dipping one's toe in the pool and seeing tentatively how these balances are effective and then cautiously doing it again. So it's not 
a, a quantitative or a pace-driven kind of principle of adjudication. It's, it's a qualitative one. Um, and of course, we never know. The idea is not to see yourself in the first place as playing God or not playing God, but to play human and realize that whatever you do, you do with uh, the maximum amount of humility. Uh, next slide, please. And I, 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 my sister is the one who made me aware of this. This is fascinating. This is just one example, one species of the genus that I just described. Right? There are consequences to altering the ecological balances at which evolution has taken eons to arrive. Uh, just to take one example, uh, researchers have begun, begun to use CRISPR technology to attempt to provide a remedy for those who suffer from sickle cell anemia. This is an article that just came out. I'm happy to share it with you if anyone wants to uh, follow up with me by email. Consider, however, that sufferers of sickle cell anemia also enjoy added protection against the much more devastating malady of malaria. Uh, I think most of you know that the biggest killer in the world in terms of species are mosquitoes. Humans are number two, but we're a distant, distant second to mosquitoes. Uh, while the therapeutic benefits of applying somatic CRISPR technology, right, this is the one-off, not germline, I mean, to those afflicted with sickle cell anemia are undeniable, there is no way that we can know what the long-term impact would be of removing this gene for all individuals living in endemic areas of malaria because we lack the wherewithal to see the full scope of what causes and effects in nature attached to other naturally occurring processes. That these two conditions seem unexpectedly connected to one another at the genetic level presents an interesting naturalistic argument for the preservation of variety in the gene pool. When we homogenize, we do so at our own risk. And in a lot of ways, Atwood's Orcs and Creek is a sort of vicarious project of homogenization. Um, now, after my sister uh, told me about the science of this, there's a wonderful NOVA, uh, just by coincidence, uh, uh, treatment of CRISPR. And they actually went into the relationship, the evolutionary relationship between malaria and sickle cell anemia. And they interviewed someone who had sickle cell anemia, asking him you know, whether he would choose to snap his fingers and not have, them, have it. His answer was, was really kind of poetic, but in short, it was a no. And next slide, and this is uh, the final slide. Uh, and I just want to refer to the fact that this is not so distant in the future. Uh, for the, th the three uh, references I have here are uh, a short story I love, The Curious Case of, Case of Benjamin Button, great movie as well, starring Brad Pitt. That's, of course, a reference to the Black Mirror episode uh, that won the Emmy, um, which is, uh, it's escaping me right now. Um, I was recommended it's season three, but I'll mention that in a second. And then the very real- uh, San Junipero. But what, yeah, San Junipero, that's right. Uh, thank you, Elise. Uh, that was uh, in 2004 uh, created, and this is one of among many uh, in the United States. This is a for-profit company, and one of the world's leading sperm banks, uh, features a catalog which provides comprehensive detail about the physical characteristics, ethnicity, college major, of all of its sperm donors, where for an additional fee, customers can acquire test results, which also analyze are the donor's temperament and character type. Um, so I'm arguing here uh, at the risk of coming across as a lie, uh, about to be schooled by my colleague, that just as plants need sunlight and water to grow, uh, we're socially created and flourishing beings, whether we think we are or not, and that enhancements which serve to reduce our reliance on one another, such as the capacity to sidestep debility and sickness, draw us farther from one another, and deploy to their maximal use, become the enemy of solidarity and invite a self-induced exile. Like F. Scott F. Uh, like F. Scott Fitzgerald's Benjamin Button, who grows younger, the one rendered exempt from the normal patterns and pitfalls of aging and decline is condemned to isolation and communal estrangement. Uh, and this might be a nice segue to this Black Mirror episode. It's a wonderful, wonderful, philosophical creative hour uh, that Charlie Brooker packs in there about life after death. And one of the beautiful things like all science fiction is that it leaves the viewer uh, with the debate. It's only at the end that we find out that what is being experienced is being experienced by virtue of the contraption you see uh, right in front of you. There's so many other issues that uh, surface in this episode. I don't want to ruin it for you. Get yourself to this hour of TV if you haven't yet. And uh, this life from beyond might be the perfect segue to my colleague, uh, Elise Graham. Thank you very much. 
Uh, let's see, share my screen. Um, I'm just imitating what I see. All right, uh, I'm going to start with a video that is going to be, I'll be honest, very unsettling. All right, um, I'll just play it and then I'll, I'll add the discussion. Oh shit, I'm sorry. Can you guys hear the audio? Okay, I will reshare my screen. I realized that I forgot to do share computer sound, but I caught myself in time. And I did not swear you mistook that. I am Patricia Oliver, and this is my husband, Manuel. Two years ago, our beautiful son, Joaquin, was shot and killed at Parkland. Every day I think about him and what his last moments must have been like. Meanwhile, every day, nearly 100 more families lose someone they love to gun violence. Every single day, we keep telling people it doesn't have to be like this. They don't listen. So we found a way to bring back someone that no one will ignore. It's very hard for me to look at this. So please, please listen to what our son has to say. It's me, it's Guac. I've been gone for two years and nothing's changed, bro. People are still getting killed by guns. What is that? Everyone knows it, but they don't do anything. I'm tired of waiting for someone to fix it. The election in November is the first one I could have voted in, but I'll never get to choose the kind of world I wanted to live in. So you've got to replace my vote. Go to unfinishedvotes.com, register, then go vote. Vote for politicians who care more about people's lives than the gun lobby's money. Vote for people not getting shot, bro. I mean, vote for me because I can't. We've got to keep on fighting and we got to end this. Uh, we'll start my slideshow. So in October of this year, Joaquin Oliver, a student who was killed in a school shooting at Parkland, Florida in 2018, appeared in a newly released video in which he speaks about gun violence. This video is unusual because Oliver is speaking from beyond the grave. The Oliver who is speaking knows that he was killed in the Parkland shooting in 2018. The video is what's known as a deep fake. An actor portrayed Joaquin before the camera, and then Joaquin's face and voice were mapped on top of the actor's face and voice using information extracted from videos taken of the young man while he was alive. The video is unusual as of right now, December 2020. It will not be unusual for long. Deepfake technology is getting really easy to use. Here's a deepfake of the Mona Lisa, which I'm showing in order to demonstrate that we don't need a lot of images of you in order to create a really good deepfake. In a pinch, just one image will do. Uh, before I continue, I want to show you one other video. It's a video of a birthday gift that Kanye West recently gave to his wife, Kim Kardashian. He used, or rather he hired someone to use, deepfake technology to create a hologram of her deceased father, who likewise spoke to her from beyond the grave. You're 40 and all grown up. You look beautiful, just like when you were a little girl. I watch over you and your sisters and brother and the kids every day. Sometimes I drop hints that I'm around, like when you hear someone make a big peefy, or when you make a big peefy. Remember when I would drive you to school in my tiny Mercedes every day and we would listen to this song together? <laughs> Kimberly, and all 
all that you've accomplished. All of your hard work and all the businesses you have built are incredible. But most impressive is your commitment to become a lawyer and carry on my legacy. It's a long and a hard road, but it's worth it. And I'm with you every step of the way. The way that you're connecting with your roots and supporting Armenia means so much to me. You are a proud Armenian, and I am a proud Armenian father. The most beautiful thing that I have witnessed is watching you grow your family. You married the most, 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 most genius man in the whole world, Kanye West. You are the most, 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 most amazing mother to your four beautiful children, and they are perfect. Keep doing what you're doing, Kimberly. You are a beautiful soul. Know that I am very proud of you, and I'm always with you. I have built a firewall around our family. I love you, Kimberly. Tell Courtney, Chloe, and Rob I love them and miss you all. Don't forget to say your prayers. There's a lot to unpack here. Uh, I just unmuted myself, right? Great, a lot to unpack here, including the part where Mr. West has his wife's dead father say without irony that Mr. West is the most, 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 most genius man in the whole wide world. Unfortunately, we wouldn't be able to unpack all of that even if we devoted a whole series of lectures to it. Instead, I wanna talk about cyberpunk necromancy, which is now within our reach. I want to talk about the weirdness of navigating this new digital reality where we can simulate others and ourselves to take the place of the living after death. The only thing that makes this procedure unsettling, as far as I can tell, is our unwillingness to let our style, our habits, our mannerisms, uh, what is measurable and quantifiable and therefore imitable about our way of walking and talking and making art and being in the world, take the place of ourselves. As a starting point, I think a lot of people in a literature department, um, places where people think a lot about history and legacy and influence and what artists in particular leave behind to future generations would agree that leaving behind something of yourself to be remembered by is desirable. Authors leave their papers to university libraries and they leave those papers in the expectation that they will be read. We measure the greatness, if I may use that word, of artists partly on the basis of how much they influence others to imitate them, both during their lives and afterward. This is the position of the art historian Hugo van der Velden, who spent a lot of time thinking about what it means to say that a particular artist has genius. He thinks that the sturdiest definition of genius comes down to an artist's influence. Genius does something so new that others are compelled to imitate that lead. There, hold on. Why is this not? Uh... There is an age of Rembrandt, he says, because Rembrandt is such a towering presence that people followed through on or tried to imitate what he did. In other words, genius for him is a style that we feel compelled to follow through on. This isn't the only definition of genius, but this way of thinking becomes important when we bring computers into the mix. This brings me to the subject of algorithms and the algorithmic generation of art. An algorithm is a set of instructions, a procedural sequence of steps to be followed. When used in computing, an algorithm must be specific enough that a computer can understand it. Many different sequences of steps can be written to carry out the task of a particular algorithm. That is, an algorithm can be written in multiple ways, all of them workable. But on the level of computer code, an algorithm will not leave room for multiple interpretations. So, a sequence of steps, a way of getting from point A to point B. Keep that in mind, and now let's talk about the artistic quality called style. This is Senses of Style by a literary scholar called Jeff Dolvin. His journey to writing this book began when he was a little boy and his father, who loved classical music, put on a record for him. His father said, who is this? Who wrote this piece of music? And Jeff, although he had never heard this particular piece of music before, knew the correct answer. He said Bach, referring to the composer Johann Sebastian Bach was a precocious child. His father said, yes, but how do you know? He knew it was Bach because it was Bach's style. 
but how did he know it was Bach's style? What is style? Two decades later, in 1986, a computer scientist at SUNY Buffalo created a program called Choral that could generate four-part chorale harmonizations that imitated the work of Bach so well that only experts could tell that the music wasn't really by Bach. Even so, the experts only knew that it wasn't by Bach because the program imitated Bach's style too well. It was too faithful somehow in its adherence to his special qualities. How can your style be too much like you to be you? How do we distinguish, because there clearly are distinctions if experts could say this isn't Bach, how do we distinguish between an artist, what we love about an artist, and his style? I mentioned Rembrandt, the 17th century Dutch painter. Uh, in 2016, Microsoft, together with the Delft University of Technology and other partners, worked together to use AI to create an entirely new Rembrandt, an entirely new painting in Rembrandt style. Here's how they did it. I hope you don't mind my going into the weeds a little bit, but here's how computers make possible a level of imitation that humans themselves haven't managed. The key terms are machine learning and training data. Machine learning is the study and use of a set of algorithms that analyze data for pattern finding and the prediction of future behavior. When we say machine, we just mean that the learning is automated. We input data, say um, a set of videos of Joaquin or a set of paintings that were painted by Rembrandt. And then based on that data, we ask the machine to perform tasks to say uh, how this person is likely to speak next, how this person is likely to walk, how this person is likely to paint. Uh, machine learning is also used for other Please, purposes. Sorry to interrupt, but we're not seeing your slides. Really? What are yeah, you Yeah, we seeing? still see the video of... Uh, of uh, My apologies. No, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, all right, that's embarrassing. Can someone unmute me? Am I muted? Can I talk? I'm ready to go. <laughs> All right, my apologies. Uh, it's also used for other purposes. For instance, to determine in advance what kind of advertisement a user is likely to click on or to detect credit card fraud or to find areas of the city in which crime is likely to occur tomorrow. Um, we can subdivide machine learning into supervised and unsupervised learning. With supervised learning, you tell the program what you're looking for. And with unsupervised learning, you give the program input data, but no output. You say, here's the data, and it's up to you, the program, to find regularities or patterns in the data. The nice thing about unsupervised learning is that you could discover things in the data that weren't there before. So you could discover regularities in someone's style that you hadn't noticed, even though you are an expert. Training data is the input data that you give to a program during unsupervised learning. You expose the program to a bunch of data that's been relabeled by humans. This is a cat, this isn't a cat. And gradually the program learns how to identify a cat on its own. This was actually the very first use of unsupervised learning that researchers did at Google's Bleeding Edge X Lab. In 2012, the X Lab performed an experiment in machine learning to determine whether a computer could learn to recognize shapes and concepts um, on its own. It did so, the experiment was successful after looking at approximately 20,000 randomly chosen video thumbnails from YouTube. The network created this image of a cat, this Shroud of Turin-like Ur cat that it could use uh, to recognize cats later on. Anyway, so in 2016, researchers at Microsoft seeking to create a new Rembrandt painting exposed their AI to training data consisting of 346 artworks known to be by Rembrandt. I quote here from the white paper these guys produced. Uh, to create new artwork using data from Rembrandt's paintings, we had to maximize the data pool from which to pull information. Because he painted more portraits than any other subject, we narrowed down our exploration to those paintings. Then we found the period in which the majority of these paintings were created between 1632 and 42. And then we funneled down that selection starting with gender and went on to analyze everything from age and head direction to the amount of facial hair present. After studying the demographics, the data led us to a conclusive subject, a data of a Caucasian male with facial hair between the ages of 30 and 40, wearing black clothes with a white collar and a hat facing to the right. A uh, pixel by pixel analysis showed how Rembrandt likes to use his brush strokes, etc. Anyway, this is the new painting. This is the computer generated Rembrandt. Do you like it? 
Is it convincing? Does it count? <laughs> does it count as capital A art? Does it count as a Rembrandt? A lot of people, a lot of people didn't like it. Uh, in the New Yorker, Peter Schadel called the painting a faux Rembrandt. He also called it fan fiction, and he meant that as an insult. He said, the artist's response to a subject, not just how he expressed it, is what gives drama and value to a work. Never mind what the picture looks like. Is a woman who looks like your mother, your mother? In truth, the portrait wobbles at a second glance and crashes at a third. The sitter has a sparkle of personality, but utterly lacks the personhood, the beingness that never eluded Rembrandt. All right, I'll be honest, our critic is not my profession, but I've looked at a lot of Rembrandts and I like to draw imitations of uh, pictures. These are some of my drawings from high school. So this is the Mona Lisa done by MC Escher. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is I do imitations myself. I have thoughts about what distinguishes a good imitation from a bad imitation, and I'm gonna throw it down right now. I think the Microsoft Rembrandt is good. <laughs> I even think it's art, and I even think it's a Rembrandt, so Susan and I can get in a fight during the comments period. Like many people in the year 2020 who are trying to forecast a digital world beyond their own lifetime, I have appointed legacy contacts to my own various social media accounts. That means that if I die unexpectedly, there's a girl named Michelle in Boston who will inherit my Facebook account and will be able to make posts in my place. Of course, Michelle will die too someday. Maybe my social media accounts will be passed down through her family like out of date heirloom jewelry. Or maybe they'll pass off the accounts to a machine learning system like ones that are already being developed that will look through my posts and learn how to make new posts in my style. My life online will have provided training data for a bot that imitates and extends my life online in perpetuity. Do I want that to happen? No. I find it upsetting to think that an imitation of me, even a very good one, would be set up to speak or act in my place. This despite the fact that some of the time when I'm writing or when I'm teaching, what I'm actually doing is imitating myself. This despite the fact that I would be flattered if someone tried to imitate, for instance, the way that I write. This despite the fact that I like the Rembrandt and I see no problem with making algorithmic imitations of Bach. And this despite the fact that I kind of want machines someday to take up the legacy of human civilizations and travel to regions or to times in the distant future where we cannot go. The Shakespeare scholar David Scott Caston offers an analysis of the devastating line by King Lear when he discovers that his daughter Cordelia is dead. How can a dog, a cat, have life and not thee? Caston says, the question is urgent and horrific, but there's no answer. That's tragedy. He compares the moment to a moment in the book of Job that readers tend to find really unsettling, which is when God rewards Job for his faithfulness not by bringing his children back to life, but by giving him a set of new children to replace the children who have died. So it says, here's a new wife, here's new children. They're already like 10, 12 years old, all right? <laughs> to replace the ones that, that died. Um, to most readers, this replacement doesn't seem to come close to replacing what was lost. The individuality, the integrity, the uniqueness of the individual that tragedy destroys and how you can possibly compensate for that, Caston says, I think Shakespeare began there. People, individual people, are irreplaceable and we become uncomfortable, I think, in proportion to the directness with which people try to use technology to replace our personhood. I don't think anyone in this virtual room was at ease while watching the hologram of Robert Kardashian, uh, let alone when he turned to dust at the end. Um, but despite our comfort or our lack of comfort, cyberpunk necromancy is already here. We will have to figure out how to deal with it and maybe pass new laws concerning image rights, concerning slander, concerning revenge porn, to name three legal areas that have already gotten involved with deep fake technology. And we'll need to figure it all out very soon. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Imitation is one of the cornerstones of art. Imitation in the 21st century 
is a very dangerous application of technology. I'd like to conclude by playing one last video. Trying to play this. This is a PSA. You can't believe anything you see these days. These glasses aren't even real. Can you see this? Neither is my face. All this stuff was- All right, I'm gonna try this again. Stop sharing, hold on. Ah, let me try this one more time. Share computer sound, share, go. This is a, P this is a PSA. You can't believe anything you see these days. These glasses aren't even real. Neither is my face. All this stuff was 3D tracked on using these dots that I drew on with this marker. Actually, the marker isn't real either. Neither is the background or my face. Have a good night. This is a PSA. Um, just to be clear, this is a TikTok. I want to... I want to emphasize as much as I can how um, easy it is to make a TikTok video. Um, like some guy in his bedroom made this. This was not made. This was not made by scientists at MIT. This was just some dude. Like TikTok is the lowest possible bar for content creation, and I say that with love and admiration. All right. That was just to show you how easy deepfake technology is becoming to use. Okay, that was an ordinary teenager on TikTok, which is an ordinary, very trendy video sharing site. TikTok is a bit like YouTube, except the videos are shorter. All of us hope for and expect some sort of legacy when we're gone. Uh, in the coming age, that legacy may be very different from what any of us were prepared to expect. And the coming age uh, is already at hand. Thank you. Wow, um, you both gave us so much to think about. Um, I think um, we will handle questions uh, either by using the little symbol to raise your hand um, or putting it into the, um, the chat. Um, I'm gonna try to go to a form where I can see all of you listed um, and then I should be able to see more. Of, ah, there's a hand already, Connor. Um, has a question, comment? Let's see, and it takes a minute for me to unmute you. No, it's all right, I'm right here. Uh, how you doing? Uh, my name is Connor, I'm an MHA student here at Stony Brook, um, and I also work at uh, Stony Brook IT, and I dabble in machine learning as well in my measly little apartment. Just to show how easy it is, it actually is very easy. I do it in my little studio apartment down the street. Um, so the other, one thing I wanted to bring up about machine learning I didn't hear touched upon was um, the issue with machine learning supervised or unsupervised, since it's relying on data that's given to it by a human, um, there is inherent bias based on the human that's inputting the data. Uh, there was an uh, instance found in healthcare specifically uh, where there was a racial bias found in a major healthcare risk algorithm that was, uh, that was built by humans. But what happened was is they found that African-American patients were not receiving um, critical care because the algorithm was basing it on their healthcare spending. So they found that the African-Americans were being unfairly prejudiced by the, uh, or discriminated against by the algorithm, uh, but that was fed human data. So um, what do you feel like, uh, Elise or Dr. Flesher, whoever uh, is comfortable answering this, do you feel like there's, what's like, do you have any recommendations on like ways to get around that? Or what do you feel like is the, the holy grail to prevent discrimination from these kinds of things? Uh, I'll, uh, I'll start, um, yeah, to provide a little more background of what he's talking about. With supervised learning, you tell the program what you're looking for, or rather you give the program a specified output. You say all email is either spam or not spam. This is what spam looks like. This is what spam does not look like. Now sort my email. With unsupervised learning, you give the program input data, but no output. So you say this is a human being. This is not a human being. This is a human being. This is not a human being. Um, here's the data. It's up to you to find regularities or patterns in the data. So not just identify what's a human being, but find other regularities or patterns that I might not have thought of. Um, the nice thing about unsupervised learning is you can discover things in the data that you didn't expect to be there. However, um, raw data is an oxymoron. Um, there's no such thing as raw data. There's no such thing as data that has been unprocessed, you know, um, uh, uninterpreted, uh, everything is already sort of processed through the people who collect it. 
um, here are some more scary things that come out of machine learning. Uh, Self-driving cars are more likely to hit black people. Uh, that's because the training data that's been provided to self-driving cars uh, concerning what counts as a person and what does not count as a person uh, has far more images of fair-skinned people than people of color. Um, so you can see that this is literally a matter of life or death um, and a matter of re-adjudicating our humanity. Um, again, <laughs> uh, wars have been fought over this issue, but now we have to teach the machines this is what counts as a human. Um, I think that one of the solutions to the problem is going to have to be to, uh, we need more different kinds of people working in Silicon Valley. Uh, we need people who are able to um, catch the blind spots that the 20 something white dudes who are currently doing most of the coding may not be able to catch on their own. Uh, we need to um, have oversight boards that think very carefully about the ethical implications of what we're doing and um, we have to step away from um, our, an understanding in the public and in government, if not in Silicon Valley, that algorithms are clean or neutral or not biased because they're simply mathematics. Um, all of this um, is going to take time and it's going to take will, and I don't know if we have either of those things, but you've identified a very real problem. I, I just want to add, uh, it's really a conundrum with some issues, like with respect to what goes wrong in technology, there's a lot you can do as you learn to mitigate against those outcomes. Um, you can do a lot about off-target, you know, or unexpected kinds of outcomes as you learn more. And then implicit bias will at best partially be dealt with by the way that uh, Dr. Graham suggests, which, which is the best idea I can come up with at the outset get a plurality of people uh, from different backgrounds uh, involved. But I do not know what the answer is to uh, dealing with the problems that ensue from technology that works as it's intended to work. And when you impose regulations that tell someone not to do something the way it's intended to do, I have no idea how those regulations could be implemented or, or effective. Um, and it's terrifying. Uh, and just to, just to quickly end with the point, another Black Mirror episode that your presentation reminded me of, Dr. Graham, I know what you're, <laughs> you know what I'm about to say, is the other one that almost won the Emmy, uh, Emmy which is called Be Right Back, which is about a woman that loses uh, her loved one too early, and he comes back and it's chilling just the degree to which it resembles the person that she's lost. And again, Brooker makes you ask, is this something you go for or not? It's not entirely clear. Now, let's say that technology becomes available in the ways in which your presentation elicited. If we took a poll among the participants that are still here, I don't think we'd all get the same answers. And I don't think we get the same answers if we answer that question right now, as opposed to when we were in the situation, really wanting to see the person that we miss. Uh, it's a brave new world, <laughs> to quote Huxley. Uh, there's a, a hand up, uh, Christopher Calarza. Hi, so um, I'm an MPH student here at Stony Brook. Um, and so both of you mentioned that uh, we are, you know, in the midst of this like blurring of machine and human, right? So what I really thought about was like Donna Haraway's in A Cyborg Manifesto, right? And she kind of took it in a different way that you two were taking it where it's like, we're all cyborgs basically, right? We have inorganic matter matter allowing us to be humans. And we can use that as a way of finding commonality that isn't tied to our identities. And I just wanted to know like what, how do you guys feel how that fits into this aspect of like using technology and all these other negative aspects of it? Andrew, why don't you go first? I was gonna suggest you go first. Um, okay, I'll go first. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure the technology is inherently queer. I mean, a lot of it is coded by dudes, um, and a lot of it creates boxes that I fit into imperfectly, and so do other people who don't resemble the, the, the coders. Um, it is true, though, that um, uh, the human environment is very contoured by technology, often in ways that we're unable to see by design. Um, in Code is Law, um, a professor named Lawrence Lessig um, draws a comparison 
uh, between the laws of the state of New York and the laws of physics. Um, if I'm driving a car, I can break the laws of the state of New York while still obeying the laws of physics. Quite spectacular, I might add. Um, technology governs us more in the manner of the laws of physics than in the manner of the laws of the state of New York. It's all around us, but we really can't see what it's doing most of the time. Um, nevertheless, it governs our behavior, it governs our sense of identity, it governs how well we sense that we fit or do not fit into the world. Um, I think you brought up um, a really interesting issue of how our sense of ourselves as human is going to move forward, especially as um, the future that Dr. Flesher sketches out and the present that I'm describing come together. Mm -hmm. and, and I would only add again to that wonderful answer. Um, we are constrained at the outset of any project in life or any technical project uh, by the gigantic amount of material that we don't know that we don't know. Uh, we do not have power that we don't even know that we don't have, without which we are, at the outset of our existence, subjugated. Uh, I, I'm, I'm terrified, frankly. And, you know, when I say this kind of thing in colloquial conversations uh, with Dr. Graham, with, with other people, it, it's tempting for the interlocutor to respond, well, people have been saying this same thing since the dawn of time. And I want to say back, yeah, but this is different. This really is different. <laughs> uh, this feels, and I feel like so uh, naive and innocent and foolish for going there and old uh, for going there. Um, but your question elicits that this is different because as we know more and as we get better at doing things, uh, the person that is the programmer in whatever game is at work is such spectacular exponential power over everyone else who this technology, even if they're not engaged in it, indirectly affects. That's I the best add, I can do for an answer. I want to add as a postscript sort of more globally that Professor Flesher and I have different perspectives on the theme of um, the theme of our lectures. That is, Dr. Flesher seems, uh, if, I'm, if I can summarize, uh, is against technological immortality. And I'm in favor of it, but horrified by what it looks like in practice. <laughs> I think that's accurate, an accurate contrast. Other questions, comments? Um, oh, here's one from Adrian that uh, is in the chat. So let me read it. Uh, bias seems to be at the heart of both the topics that were presented in terms of what the people who are developing this technology feel and or are pushing for regarding what they think should be or should become the norm. Won't those who object to the direction of these technologies be drowned out by those who want it to progress? Maybe I'll begin here. Um, so this, to me, this question refers to that um, list that I presented. And that was just a working list. I've got, you know, that's the small list. And then I've got the master list, which is like four times as long of all the things that we either can do or on the cusp of being able to do, or that through genetic ed editing in the not too distant future, we will be able to do. And which of those things are kosher and which aren't? And answering which aren't, um, in terms of Adrian's question, leads me to think about things like deafness and blindness and autism and Down syndrome. And even to uh, refer uh, to my colleague, uh, you know, Huntington's disease. Now that should be something that's con non-controversial to get rid of. Are, are there biases implicit at work, even with regard to the things that seem to fall squarely under the category of medical therapy? I think it's a really tough question that I'm again, you know, not fully equipped to answer, but I agree with Adrian that, that bias will govern how we answer those questions. I mean, let's just start here and I'm interested in what others think. Would we get rid of deafness if we could? Would we get rid of the form of deafness that is caused by genomic malady? That's open. Autism.
would we get rid of tribalism? Would we get rid of our tendency to drift towards sectarian settings? Do we want to be perfectly, I don't want to use a controversial term like globalist, but perfectly acculturated internationalists who do not have a disposition to discriminate? As you run down this list, I'm reminded of the um, mission statement of the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Stony Brook, which is making science fiction a reality. Um. I find horrifying. I have find, okay, I, I, I'm trying to be a good host and let others uh, speak. No, I brought it up because I knew you would find it horrifying. <laughs> it's, it's worse than far beyond, I think. Um, and. And Andy, the list that you're going on, I, my blood pressure rises as you proceed on that list. It's like, hell no, we don't want to get rid of the flaws that make us human. Not because only that, but if we got rid of tribalism, then how would we learn how to identify and uh, exclude people who like pineapple on their pizza? Seems well, look, I'll, I'll say something very oh. controversial right now. And I love the Rolling Stones. I don't think it was right for Mick Jagger to avail himself of in vitro fertilization to orphan what will be a young child someday. And I don't mean to be morbid about this, but there are consequences to his choosing to have a child at the age of 73 years old. I had the same sorts of issues along different lines, not related to age, about the optimum. There's a, I really am attracted to this idea of homeostasis and evolution having figured out for us what the balance is that represents human flourishing, which is why I think fiction and literature of the ages is so instructive. Uh, but but I, I imagine Elise and I are not completely on the same page here either. I don't know. No, I don't, I don't think that, uh, you know, evolution left us with pinky toes and append appendices that, and, uh, and, and some people with a taste for pineapple on their pizza. Evolution makes mistakes. <laughs> The answer of evolution is this should not exist. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, uh, I, I will confess Elise is teasing me from a previous uh, Zoom forum we were on, but we will let that rest because there are some questions and comments in the chat. Um, one, and I'll go through a few of these because some are very short. Um, Cheyenne says, um, wouldn't that actually be discriminatory in a way? And I think that came in when we were talking about the elimination of um, human flaws and weaknesses. Um, and then we have, as someone um, who, uh, from Christopher, as someone who wouldn't, would have died without technology, I feel mixed about this. And so again, it, it's a gradation. Um, we rely on technology. Um, most of us would have died without technology. Um, I would have been a really bad cave woman because Without these, I can't see the screen unless I go like this, right? So I'd be dead too. I mean, so there's, there's gradations indeed. Um, and then um, we have Adrian saying, I think fantasy plays a huge role with both topics. Um, okay, we'll, we'll pause there with those ideas put out on the table. Um, uh, any comments from the, the two speakers? I mean, as soon as you brought up deafness, of course, one thinks of deaf culture, deaf with a capital D, and all of the things that have come out of that. I mean, the remarkable things about humans is that we create, um, you know, um, the circumstances in which we find ourselves often serve as a trellis on which the most remarkable things about humanity grow. Um, I don't think that we would want to give up those things about ourselves. Um, so to say, to remove deafness would be to remove deaf culture. And I'm not sure that very many people, if they understood what that meant, would be in favor of it. Um, to get rid of autism would be to get rid of what um, autistic people often say is a profound part of themselves. Um, on the other hand, um, if I could wave my hand and get rid of mosquitoes, I would. So. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Anne Kaplan had a, a comment. Is it all right for me to unmute you, Anne, or to ask you to unmute? Okay. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes. Right. It's, I was commenting that obviously right now these huge questions sort of are undecidable. It, and we're at the stage where the discussions like these are obviously the way to work through all kinds of the undecidabilities to 
see whether the consensus can come or someone can arrive at a decision. But I'm, one, I'm interested in knowing more about what regulations are in place now, if there are some about these technologies and who is in control of those boards that are or are not. It's not clear from what you said, what's regulated, what's not, who can do what. And again, who is deciding who can do what? Because they, like you said about the technology itself, who is at the helm? of whatever regulatory boards are, are, I assume, being set up, will determine what, what rules or regulations get put in place. Again, about race, gender, uh, and such categories will depend. The answer is not the one you want to, that one would want to hear. So Dudna wrote her book in 2017, but it pretty much came out in 2018. She, wrote, she won the Nobel Prize in 2020. And in her book, and still, she was calling to not just a slowing down, not the precautionary principle, but a full you know, cessation of the technology because there were absolutely no universals to caution and oversight, none. Now, you can imagine that when it comes to a vaccine, like the one that's we're poised to right. uh, utilize with COVID, that the international community to, can, can come to some pretty quick consensus about procuring a safe and effective vaccine. There's not that much controversy in what we mm -hmm. want to see. But when it comes to a technology that's not necessary in the kind of temporal way that a vaccine is, but one that will give its possessor a leg up, <laughs> you act responsibly and you're like the good guy in the film who's got the kryptonite fatal flaw. The bad guy always points out that you know, you're hampering yourself in an undue strategic <laughs> fashion <laughs> that's just gonna lead to the advantage of someone else. That there is literally no universal consensus on this. And that while they ended up looking very good by stopping uh, China, I'm talking about the government of China right now, by stopping Jin Kuhi He from you know, continuing his research under the guise of no universal standards, the real reason they jailed him is because he didn't even give them proprietary oversight. He was rogue. <laughs> Uh, so it, it, it's terrifying. There's absolutely nothing of which I'm aware of. Um, now that is the major bioethics issue with regard to this current technology. I am assuming for the purposes of our literary gathering in the Humanities Institute that optimistically that regulation can rush in and we can have some sensible universal oversight and have nice rules of humanitarian discourse, maybe invoke Habermas to that effect. Um, who is, I think, philosophically built for just this kind of problem. And we're still going to have a nightmare of what happens when everything goes right. Uh, we still don't know because nobody could know how we're affecting the homeostasis at which we've evolutionarily arrived. I mean, I'm appalled by, and I'm sure you all are, by the nationalism and the competition about the virus, which is just shocking. We should all be, should be a collaborative project, right? Instead, nations are racing to shame the others because the UK got there before. I, I just find that shocking. So it would be awful if this same kind of competition and national, you know, nationalism was to arrive. Because again, this is clearly a project for everyone to be engaged at collaboratively. But um, but humans can't do that. I'm afraid we're we're, we're not built, are we, for collaboration? I'm good at making those sorts of decisions. Um, I, sorry, say that, Elise. I didn't. Miss we're not good at making those sorts. No, of decisions. right. Um, yeah, uh, so the first wave of court cases concerning deep fakes and other forms of imitation are still going through the courts. Uh, there was, there, there is an interesting um, case in litigation where a woman accused her husband of abuse and produced a video uh, to demonstrate it, and this turned out to be a deep fake that she produced at home, by the way, using YouTube tutorials. Um, uh, and of course, um, act actors and actresses are becoming subject to forms of pornography where their faces are put on top of the bodies of porn actors, and this is sold for quite a lot of money. Uh, you can see what some of the implications of this are. Um, uh, just talking about what this might mean for us, um, even outside of the litigation of courts. Um, let me talk for a moment about an older and less technologically oriented, but still very good hoax, which was the War of the Worlds broadcast. Um, yeah. 
of you guys yeah. um, have heard of this one, October 31st, 1938, at least a right. million Americans were convinced by a radio broadcast that was a play, a story by Orson Welles, that Martians were invading the earth. So they wept and they prayed and they called police departments and they ran around the streets with towels meant to guard them from the um, weaponized extraterrestrial gas that the Martians were purported to. Um. But anyway, so a psychologist wrote a year later, a study of this phenomenon and why it was that people were led to believe this. And his study, even though it was published in 1940, actually offers a really good guide to understanding how people are misled, not just by deep fakes, but also by conspiracy theories and forms of hoaxes that appear online. One of the things that he says is that um, a fantastical story will seem believable if it comes from a person who appears mm -hmm. true. The problem is we can now make anyone appear trustworthy. Um, so we're talking about um, very old um, psychological pattern, psychological codes um, that we can now hijack uh, using technology. Uh, additionally, he found that listeners were more likely to find out that the invasion was a fiction, to figure out that it was a fiction, if they consulted sources that had not themselves been affected by the broadcast. So if they turned the radio dial and other radio stations didn't know this broadcast was taking place, so they said, well, here's the news, nothing happened today because it's not, you know. Uh, and if people called their friends or went outside and talked to their neighbors, their friends and neighbors were also listening to the radio. <laughs> but can you check a source that has not itself been um, affected by the misinformation? Yeah. The yeah. On the internet, it's becoming harder and harder to find anyone who isn't affected by a stray tweet by a powerful person that says something that isn't true. Everyone gets affected by that. It's hard to find, you know, we are, we are losing out on um, sources of information that are not affected by other sources of information. It's getting harder and harder to figure out what's true. Um, this is going to make it even more difficult. And I wanna say again, I'm kind of in favor of this stuff. I'm just horrified by what it looks like in practice. Okay, we are almost at the end of our time. But uh, Delisha Caymans has patiently um, had a question. She is, uh, so we will let that be the last question or comment. Um, so, Delisha. Thank you, Susan. Hey, guys. Um, Dr. Flesher, I agree with you. My new bucket list is to co teach a course with Elise. Um, so, I understand. <laughs> your one of my TAs. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, so I wanted to make two comments because I teach philosophy and technology and come from a background in, in uh, technology. One, the problem, what you were speaking before about Dr. Flesher in terms of what we want uh, less globalization or really not to be tribalistic, et cetera, is that we use technology, we used to use technology to make life easier. Right, to do the physical task that we had no time to do, not the physical strength to do, kind of to extend ourselves physically. But now we start to use technology to do the kind of work that only a human being can do. Things such as thinking, um, ethics, making ethical choices. And this is really, for me, at the crux of the problem that I share with you that I fear what AI will develop into in the future because we are handing over something that is so specifically human to, as Professor Graham says, um, a machine or a device that can only do what we tell it to do. That said, what we really should be fearful of is creative AI. That is AI that is able to take the information and create new um, strategies, new programming, new opportunities that we can't process that fast or that we have yet to come across. And then my last comment is to Professor Graham in that you may have digital immortality whether or not you like it. I have been um, searching for whatever program I saw on TV and I want to guess it was either Nova or Frontline, but it was about a UK man who had to li literally go to fight against a university um, AI research John Ronson, team. right? Is it the one that where they, he took, they took his image? Yes. Yes, okay, I'm and created an imitation Twitter account. And he literally had to sort of say, well, I'm here and please stop this. And they're kind of like, mm, why should we? Um, so where that 
where this interest in it's for the sake of um, investigation and research that will affect us all. Facebook has done it, Google has done it, Twitter has done it, et cetera, these ex social experiments. Um, that will supersede our individual rights, even to our identity, such that we may, as this current generation to the horror of my generation, opens themselves up to everything on the internet without necessarily feeling that it's, you know, peeping into them, whereas we feel this is an um, invasion of privacy, we may also one day get to the point through media cultivation, you know, you hear the same idea over and over and over, you start resisting it, that we don't really have a right to our individual um, identities, that they too can be corporately owned. Thank you. Is a PhD student in philosophy, and she's a subtle and rigorous thinker on these matters. Um, <laughs> Uh, John Ronson um, uh, went to uh, the court of public opinion, at least over a Twitter account, a Twitter bot that was made to imitate him, but but said some, I think, sexual things. Um, uh, uh, and of course, you know, uh, every time every time we've tried to train an AI to act like a human, it has wound up acting like the very worst. <laughs> I'm reminded of the experiment where Microsoft um, had a Twitter bot that interacted with people on the internet um, and it started out as um, an ordinary Twitter bot and it became, and I'm not using this metaphorically, a uh, Nazi. Um, uh, Mike Rubenstein, a friend of mine and a colleague in the English department, um, once had a lovely mordant line which is, maybe technologies always begin by trying to create things and end up by trying to control people, um, which seems to be the, the pattern that computing itself has taken where it started out by, by weaving, <laughs> weaving tapestries using punch cards. And now we find it uh, sucking data out of us and creating imitations of our tastes so that ads can be delivered to us uh, more conveniently. Um, yeah, we're already in many ways in the world that we're already entirely in the world that I described and we're in many ways in the world that Professor Flesher has described. And I think that it's imperative that we think these things through very, 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 very quickly um, because it's already a, a little bit too late um, to pull the brakes. I just wanna add, um, thank you for those wonderful and perceptive comments, uh, Licia. Um, you actually raised two issues and, and I might end on this bittersweet note. With regard to the issue of AI, um, perfecting and then perfecting itself such that we can't tell the difference. Uh, I have no answer to that. Um, you know, maybe maybe even Mike's pessimistic uh, judgment will go away in a terrifying way because we won't even be able to, to, to see that distinction. And here's the bittersweet saving grace, although I don't imagine it's going to provide that much solace. Maybe at the end of the day, the one thing that keeps humans human is the suffering is the struggle, is the ephemerality in specific, and that it's that trace of our flaw that will be able to allow us to tell the difference in the long run, because that trace of the flaw always calls attention to the beautiful thing that it replaced. Now, I'm, I'm describing an, an idea that's as old as the hills, which is that of theodicy, and there's problems with theodicy. Theodicy is the idea that there, I mean, C.S. Lewis was a masterful articulator of this. It was in the Tales of Narnia, it was in his religious and philosophical writings, that there can't be- Paul a, Stevens' a, Sunday morning, uh, death is yeah. the of beauty. And, and this might be the thing that, that by its very nature that AI is never able to get, as it were. And I use that with scare quotes. I'm just thinking out loud, uh, but that, that's sort of the thesis, the normative thesis towards which I was edging in my remarks earlier. So maybe the most human thing we can do is fail. Go ahead, Sue. <laughs> I, I'm afraid that we, we have run over time um, uh, because the conversation and topic are so rich.